Veterans in Transition is sponsored by HireVeteransFirst.com, Jelani Consulting, and Village Connector Community. Welcome to Veterans in Transition, where we promote the veteran community. Each week, we travel around the region highlighting veteran-related news issues and events. Correspondent Weedham Abdul has the story of this veteran who spent three years in a refugee camp. We'll talk with a veteran who found her passion in the arts. We'll hear how this veteran business owner's secret to sweet success was right in her own family. And our weekly business tip on teaming and partnering for success. But first, in this week's profile, We'll hear from a veteran who spent three years in a refugee camp. He joined the United States Navy, and his business model is designed to help veteran business owners and veterans seeking employment in the cyber and healthcare field. International correspondent Weedham Abdul has his story. Tell us about your journey from Liberia to the United States and how that eventually led to your service in the U.S. military. Looking back, my journey really, I would consider a rite of passage uh, personally for myself because uh, it was a long journey coming to the United States. Uh, it all started when there was a civil war that started in 1998. And I happened to be in boarding school at the time. And as a kid growing up, you don't think about war or tribal warfare. And I was cut in the middle as a child growing up. And so I was on campus, I do recall, where my father sent the bodyguards to pick me up. And the purpose of that um, bodyguards coming to pick me up, it turned out that one of his bodyguards was killed in an ambush. And he realized that we were from the leading tribal group that was running the government, and our family would have been in danger. So he therefore sent the bodyguards to pick me up. And I recall, again, arriving at the house and realizing that my parents had already had everything packed up and we were immediately forced to leave the country to go to a neighboring country in Sierra Leone as refugees. And we ended up living in refugee for three years, which I recall also just realizing how devastating things were. So my sibling and I ended up living in Sierra Leone for three years where there were moments in time where we were told our parents were killed and I also really felt just hopeless. Never would I ever have a future again, don't have a parent and living as a refugee in a country where I, never was, I was never born. Through the United States program for resettlement, I was fortunate to come to the U.S. as an immigrant with my family. There's over 11 of us you know, six sisters and four brothers. And we came to the United States, and it was really cool that winter month, and we arrived in New York. I remember just getting a taste of the cold winter, and it was really cold, and we came in with just barely had any jackets or, or winter gear, and, uh, but we were lucky. We were happy to be in the United States as immigrant. I went to middle school, um, and then I decided, I said, well, I have to somehow go on to college or I can join the military. And my father was a colonel. So I wanted to follow after his full step. And secondly, I felt like joining the U.S. Navy would have been a way of giving thanks to the United States for bringing my family to the U.S. So I joined the Navy um, 1999, right after high school. I went to high school in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and I was stationed down Virginia Beach where I had the opportunity to work in the F-18 squadron. And what's interesting about the Navy was that they put you as a plane captain and I was in charge of an F-18 squadron jet. And so as a plane captain, I was responsible for aviation of that part of life whenever he took, he take off and landing. I did all the QA inspection to make sure each components on the F-18 was 
safe enough for the pilot to fly. And so I went to school on the GI Bill. I got the associate degree in business and went on to the University of Baltimore, where at the time I was so passionate about real estate, which I'm still in, but I went on and got a degree in real estate economic development thanks to the GI Bill. And after my college years, I decided to go on to pursue my career as an entrepreneur. How has being a veteran prepared you for business? Being a veteran prepared me for business in so many possible ways in the sense that, number one, in the military we have, what, especially within the Navy, our Navy core value, honest commitment and integrity. Uh, those core values are driving force and navigators that I was able to use as a guiding principles to go into business for myself. How does your business serve veterans? Our business model, as I mentioned, being a platform model, we have significant impact on the veteran community in various um, domain. And what I mean by domain is that we're, number one, able to integrate small business, veteran-owned company, and be able to bring them on board as partners because uh, Next Gen Cyber, our recruitment model is really based on building team. You know, there's no I in business. Business is really a contact sport. You can bring in partners to work together to compete. So by bringing in small business of veteran-owned businesses and then also connecting with veteran community transitional program recruiters around the country, we are able to have massive impact on the veteran community by offering them employment opportunity. And then on the educational side, we have Next Gen Cyber Academy, where we can then have veterans purchase courses for up to ethical hacking, Cisco certification. We have those courses online where they can freely take these courses and learn anywhere in the world because it's all mobile, it's on the cloud-based courses. So that's kind of the impact we're able to have on the veteran community. Share some words of wisdom for veterans who are contemplating entrepreneurship after service. The one advice I'll give out there to the veteran community if you're contemplating being an entrepreneur and going into business for yourself, uh, there's a really good book I like to reference. It's called Outweighting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. He also wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. Um, and there was one passage I recall, and within that passage, there was a term called definiteness of, definiteness of purpose. And it's really about a burning desire within the individual. And that burning desire could be you having a kid in college, uh, one have the opportunity to take care of your kids or family or loved ones, and using that as a burning desire to go into business. And by having that definiteness of purpose and having that burning desire, you can use those as a driving uh, navigator to help you whenever you're going through hard time and adversity. Because business is challenging, it is a contact sport. There will be days where you want to give up. And so by having those burning desire, you can use it as a driving force to keep pushing forward in life. So as a veteran, if you're looking to go into business, uh, I would definitely advise you find what I call definiteness of purpose, a burning desire. What was your vision of America as a child in Liberia? As a child in Liberia growing up and thinking of the United States, I just thought it was the land of opportunity. I mean, America has always been that country of, of beacon of hope and opportunity. And so growing up, we used to role play with my cousin, my siblings of what is it like being in America? Imagine just living in a country where anything was possible. And I still believe today America is the country of opportunity. Anything you dream is possible. And so as a child growing up, uh, America was always that beacon of hope. She joined the Marine Corps to see the world. And when she returned home, her experiences helped fuel her passion for the art and her purpose for helping others in the veteran community and beyond. Emotionally, it affected me way more than I ever thought it would because I missed the structure, I missed the camaraderie, I missed having a purpose. And I struggled with finding my purpose in life after 
my service in the Marine Corps was over, but I was approached by my seventh grade social studies teacher. I had moved back home to Metter, and she asked me if I'd be interested in teaching art. Well, I am not really a kid person, or I didn't think that I was, but I agreed, sure, why not? And it's always been a passion of mine. I've been drawing, painting since I could pick up a pencil and a paintbrush. I really got into it and the kids really, really liked me. They enjoyed my class, which I guess my enthusiasm really rubbed off and I appreciated their enthusiasm in return. And we started all of these community projects. We did a lot of volunteer projects at the nursing home. We went to the VA. We did a large scale mural in town. Our town's slogan is everything's better in Metter. So we used the slogan and created a 50 foot long mural. And that was really good because they got the, the experience of developing a project like that from beginning to end. I taught them the grid method, so mathematics was involved. It, there's really a science to it. I was in the Miss Georgia pageant in 2000 and I drew. I was the first one in the history of the Miss America organization to draw as a talent. And um, since then, um, there have been speed drawers and speed painters who have competed in Miss America. So I spoke with Dr. Julie about that um, experience and hey, why not? That would be something neat that we could do and present to the people. So it developed by my favorite song, which is Mariah Carey's 2002 hit, Through the Rain. And it kind of just went very well with the subject matter. It's a women's empowerment conference. So we have the sole female who's walking through the rain, holding her umbrella, and she's making it through the rain. Aside from teaching art, being an art teacher, I do corks and canvas events where I go around to different venues and hold classes. I felt a little guilty at first about leaving home and joining the military um, and not pursuing my passion. What I felt was my God-given talent and my sole purpose in life was to make people happy through art. Um, I felt a little strange about that and I didn't realize until just recently because of my drawing that my claim to fame the transition um, the boot and the heel it's it speaks for itself um, but it, it can mean many different things for you know different people but I needed that military experience I needed that structure I needed to mature and um, to be able to manage myself I've, I've grown a lot I've learned a lot through mistakes but I think as a 20 year old um, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. I don't think I would have been as successful as I am now without having had that experience and that tough skin that the military forces you to have. Next up, we'll hear how this veteran business owner's secret to sweet success was right in her own family and how she gives back to deployed units. So tell me a little bit about your military experience. Well, I commissioned through ROTC at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland back in 2008 in branch transportation. Okay. From there, I was stationed, my first and only duty station, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Center of the universe. You know it. <laughs> Airborne all the way. Um, and in 2011, my unit, full third ICTC, deployed to Baghdad, Iraq. And from there, we transitioned from Operation Iraqi Freedom to Operation New Dawn. In my particular mission as the OIC of the Crisp Yard, mm -hmm. Central Receiving and Shipping Point, it was our job, our task, to push out all equipment, vehicles, cargo from theater or Iraq back to the home state. You said that was your only duty station, and what did you do then? Did you go into, did you transition from that point? Yes, mm -hmm. um, we redeployed back in 2011, mm -hmm. and then by the end of that year, I started my transition from active duty onto the reserve side. Okay. So I was still, as they like to say, a part-time soldier, you know, one week in a month, two weeks a year, but no longer full-time. And what was your most memorable experience during your uh, military experience? I would say my most memorable experience was just the overall influence that I had over my soldiers okay. as a leader. You know, you're coming in as a second lieutenant, and I was maybe 24 years old. And I had soldiers younger than me, but also much older than me. But I was also in charge of them. So anything that happened to them, 
happened to me. You know, what they did was a direct reflection of me. And so just knowing that my soldiers could trust me, not only with their strengths and their weaknesses, but their life, mm -hmm. it, it gets no better than that. You transitioned from the military into civilian life. How was that transition? <laughs> it, was, it was a process. And I say that because in, everything's timing. So when I was transitioning out, there was an influx of soldiers transitioning out the military. And it was also somewhat of a hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. And so it really just kind of made things 10 times harder to kind of go into the, the civilian workforce. Mm -hmm. And because it was an influx of soldiers transitioning out, it's not just me as a first lieutenant, you know, if I have my degree and my resume, but I'm also competing against lieutenant colonels, mm -hmm. sergeant majors, you know, soldiers who have been in for 20, 30 some odd years, and I have my six years of military experience. So mm -hmm. the competition almost wasn't <laughs> competition. Um, and it was, it was definitely a bumpy ride, but I wouldn't change any of it. Everything that happened then prepared me to where I am now. And where you are now is a business owner. Yes, ma'am. So tell me a little bit about your business. Okay, so Kian's Creations, LLC. Started off just doing red velvet cakes, something that I enjoyed doing um, that my grandmother taught me. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I expounded from red velvet cakes to pound cakes to different treats like Oreos, pretzels, mm -hmm. because everyone doesn't eat cake. I had to learn that. I would go, you know, parties and events and celebrations, and instead of, you know, going and buying a, a gift from Target, mm -hmm. I would bring a cake, and everyone loved it. And then by and by, maybe six or seven months later, one of my coworkers said, hey, Kiana, this cake is so good, I would buy it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the light bulb right, went off. Right, that light bulb <laughs> went off. And I said, okay, you know, you might have something here. And so from there, I started selling three-layer red velvet cakes. Mm -hmm. And I did that for almost a year. I, I was a one-trick pony. That's all I knew. I perfected that, and I was good with that. Mm -hmm. And then one day, a friend said, you know what? Can I order a pound cake? And I almost panicked. I said, well, I have red velvet cake. And I realized at that moment that it was time for me to expand my business and get out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I was doing red velvet cakes, pound cakes, cupcakes, and really just starting to kind of hone in on what it was that I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I started doing the, the Rice Krispie Treats, the Oreos, mm -hmm. the pretzels, and it really started to get fun because now I can take all of my creativity and all of my artistry and put it into something that you can eat. So say an Oreo, I can take you for instance. So I can take your name or your initial, and take your hobbies, what you like, and create it on this little bite-sized Oreo. And oh. because it's, it's custom made from my heart to yours, I'm providing a service that you really can't get in a, a storefront bakery. All right, well, how do you give back to the community through Kiana's Creations? That's a good question. So what I do, um, if not every other month, then at least once a quarter, I will reach out to a unit that's deployed overseas, whether it's, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, and I will donate five or six dozen cupcakes. Wow. And I actually, I did it because it was done to me. When I deployed to Baghdad, mm -hmm. an anonymous lady, um, you know, a, a military supporter, sent me a box of homemade chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. Now by the time they reached me, they were old and they were stale. I ate every cookie. And I did because I knew they were homemade homemade from the heart and it was special. Something that for me superseded anything that I could buy from the market in Baghdad. And so I said to myself, you know what? For me, that meant something. It was a morale booster. You know, you're away from home, you know, away from family and your mom's home cooked meals and things that just remind you of the States. So what I wanted to do now is I donate a few dozen cupcakes to soldiers who are overseas just to kind of give them something sweet and just to let them know that, you know, home is still here and you know, we'll be waiting when they return. I'm sure those soldiers and service members, period, are excited about deploying now, <laughs> getting your trees. <laughs> All right, so the you mentioned your transition was um, challenging. Um, we have tons of service members that is facing that right now. If you could give them one piece of advice about transitioning, what would it be? Be proactive. 
don't wait. The day that you should start working on your transition should not be the day that you're officially a civilian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure that your resume is spot on. You know, that you're reaching out to the hiring agencies and the headhunters. Start networking with civilians who, you know, were military, and, you know, and just kind of getting tips and advice from them. If, say, you're getting out January 2019, no less than six months before, you need to start getting your mind right, getting that resume together, and just getting your portfolio together to transition to that next chapter. Mm -hmm. Be as proactive as possible, because once you hit that ground, you have to hit that ground running. Well, Kiana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. In today's business tip on teaming and partnering, we'll learn that like a good marriage, finding the right partner holds the key to success. So we're here at the uh, 13th Annual uh, Veterans and Business Conference. How long have uh, your company been associated? I think we've been here all 13 years. We've been, we've been coming to this event uh, since before it was at the Army-Navy Club here. I personally have been here, I think, every single one of those years. We're a big uh, proponent uh, of this event and, and Charles and everybody else that do great work uh, putting on this wonderful event. This year you were a facilitator. Uh, share with us what your, your workshop was about. Yeah, I had a great session on teaming and partnering right up my alley. You know, for the, it was the reconnaissance track. So these are businesses that are just getting interested in government contracting. I think about a handful had done some teaming and partnering before, but most are just looking to do that. So we walked through some of the basics of how do you team and partner? What, what should you look for in a partner when you're going after federal projects? And how do you put those agreements together to protect yourself and to make sure that you really get out of that arrangement what you're hoping to get out of it? Share with us what is a common issue that you uh, find uh, that business owners, and particularly veteran business owners, uh, um, have in this area? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest issue in the beginning is that it's hard to get work unless you have one of these arrangements. You, you, need, you need to start as a subcontractor in most cases. And then I think what that leads to is maybe a sense of, I'm just going to jump at the first opportunity. Because to really play in the federal market, you have to have past performance. You have to have experience. How are you going to get that experience until you get your first contracts, but you have to be careful not just jumping at the first opportunity that comes along. You have to really read these agreements to make sure that it's, is that the right partner for you? Sometimes it's better to walk away from the arrangement until you have the right fit, the right terms, et cetera. Um, and I think the other big issue is around work share. So the reason that veteran-owned firms partnered with other small businesses or large businesses is because the project, maybe they wouldn't be able to win it on their own. You're stronger together. But you have to be sure that you're getting out of that arrangement what you expect to get out of it. So work share. You know, how much am I going to do? How much are you going to do on this project? And having clear terms around that is, is often a big issue that, that we find the veteran-owned firms encounter. Share with us, how does your firm give back to, uh, to the community? Yeah, we have a corporate responsibility group. It's a really big uh, aspect of our practice. We have a tight-knit firm. We're about 25 lawyers and about 15 staff. Everybody's very committed to that. Just recently, we were a part of the wreath cleanup uh, at Arlington National Cemetery. We do uh, a charity drive week around Veterans Day for Hero Dogs. Uh, we've been a big part of this group and, and doing training sessions. Uh, ever since the veteran-owned small business program started, we were there at the beginning. We helped to shape those regulations and get that program through. And, and now that we have the program, we're helping every day to shape the way that the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Small Business Administration is managing those programs and how the regulations evolving and just trying to make it easier and, and simpler and more effective for veteran-owned firms in working with those programs. Because it can be a challenge. I, we work with a lot of veteran-owned firms that have difficulties navigating those programs. And so we're, we're, we're trying to smooth that process. Uh, we also have, a, we've started a coalition that advocates on behalf of veteran-owned small businesses on the Hill as well. We've been working with NVSBC and big supporters of what Scott Denniston and that group, the good work that they're doing for veteran-owned small, on the advocacy front, on the educational front. Uh, they're, they're doing great work and we support them whenever we can. We're, we're, we're big proponents of them. One real hot area for veteran-owned firms that I want to make sure everyone takes away is this new mentor-protege program the SBA has. The, the SBA opened this mentor-protege program about a year ago, 
And what it does is we're talking about teaming and partners, uh, partnerships. That's my, that's my big mantra today. And mentor protege is how you really take that to the next level. Because you can go find, as a veteran-owned firm, you can get a large business to mentor you. You can partner together in joint ventures. You can go after work that you wouldn't be able to go after on your own. It's really a great way for veteran-owned firms to, to take their partnerships and their business to the next level. So look at the mentor protege program at SBA. That's all for this edition of Veterans in Transition. We ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you have a story to tell, reach out to us at vetsintransition.com. And remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time.